move on to our second talk, but we'll, um, I know there are some other questions for Will, so we'll circle back to those. Hopefully everyone else can stay. Um, so our next speaker is Ashok Prasad, uh, who will be telling us about uh, the geometry of phenotypes, cell shapes as a mirror of cell states. And we'll see what interesting correlations there are between this talk and the first one. So Ashok, take it away. Thank you, Sonia, and uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I also wanted to just say very quickly that uh, you know I'm one of the organizers now, so this but I'm, this is very recent. But uh, for those of you who've been carrying this seminar series for these many years, uh, you know, hats off to you. This is a labor of love, and it's really been one of the things I think helping build our community. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, something which uh, my, me and my group has been obsessed by for the last few years. Uh, it's largely an experimental and empirical study. Uh, there is a theoretical angle, but at this stage, uh, there are more questions. Uh, well, there, there's, there's everything is theoretical, uh, but at this stage, there are more, we have more questions than answers. Uh, so I hope I hope you'll take this talk as a way of to think about some of the questions which are which uh, uh, which we've been raising, and uh, I hope you can come back and tell me uh, uh, you know these are good ways to actually perhaps answer them. And so we begin by basically asking, and we began this you know totally for uh, for someone who was. Um, a physicist by training didn't know very much uh, real biology. Uh, this base basically began by asking, you look at you know, all these beautiful images of cells that the internet is awash in, and you ask, is there information here that is sort of somehow hidden in these structures which you can see? And of course, you know, there should be some, but is, that, is it totally random or does it somehow reflect the cell state or the cell type? in some way, uh, can we exploit it uh, in ways that we haven't done it not done it yet. Um, so uh, do tell me, by the way, in case my slides are not moving on the screen, um, they should be, but um, just in case, because Zoom is doing funny things as I speak. Uh, okay, so there are many reasons to think that, uh, you know, there should be information in what we see in these images in sort of morphology broadly defined. And so before I uh, proceed, everything I'm going to tell you is to, is coming from uh, fluorescently labeled actin filaments. Uh, so uh, we, we also worked on nuclear shapes, but I'm not going to talk about that in this talk for interest of time. And so what you're going to be basically seeing is you're going to be seeing the shape of the cell as outlined by fluorescently labeled actin filaments. And you're going to be seeing the actin organization inside the cell. And uh, for those of you who uh, don't uh, who don't know about actin, actin is probably one of the most important constituents of the cellular cytoskeleton. And the cytoskeleton itself is this uh, filamentous polymeric network uh, composed of actin, filamentous actin, microtubules, and intermediate filaments, which is cross-linked, which is a cross-linked meshwork that gives the cell its rigidity and its active mechanical properties. Of these. Actin is in some ways uh, uh, yeah, important for uh, specifically for shape, for force generation, and for you know a bunch of other dynamic properties. Um, uh, microtubules and intermediate filaments are believed to be more important uh, for things like rigidity, and of course, microtubules are important for cell division and for cr chromosome segregation and all of that stuff. So there are very good reasons why you might think that this shape of the cell carries information. So for example, you could ask yourself, what about the bulk mechanical properties of this blob of matter that is the cell? Where does it come from? Well, you know, clearly it's affected by the composition, how much actin there is, how much, how many microtubule filaments there are, what are they, how many intermediate filaments there are, what's the different ratio of different types of intermediate filaments? which have different stiffness properties. And all of that is actually determined by the cell, right? All of that can be changed. It's part of the genetic program of the cell. And so all that, in a sense, is a reflection of uh, the cell genotype. You could ask when a cell spreads on the surface, what drives the spreading? Well, cell spreading, we know, is driven by actin polymerization and is driven by adhesion to the surface by focal adhesions. Um, and actin polymerization forces are opposed by myosin driven contractility. And so again, both of these come from very specific, uh, you could say sort of, you know, again, uh, uh, you know, genetic programs, if you will, um, inside the cell, uh, which is which are kind of determining how much actin polymerization is going to happen, how strong is the myosin driven contractility, 
And I'm saying genetic, but this doesn't necessarily have to do with the genotype. This may be, uh, you know, this, this, this is something to do with uh, the protein program, if you will, or the, you know, the protein-protein interaction program of the, of the cell. And this image is just showing you an image of the spread cell in which you can see the uh, focal adhesions which have been uh, visualized, as well as the structure of some of the structure of actin in the cell. And you can see how the two correspond very nicely with each other. Uh, Again, you could, many of the cells show some kind of a nematic ordering of the actin, as well as uh, some elongation of the cell, usually in the direction of nematic ordering of actin. Uh, so here's one example coming from our own group. Um, and uh, again, all the red here is labeled actin. And so we understand again why this polarization happens is to do with um, basically the balance between two GT, GTPases uh, that control, that, that are master regulator, the cyto, uh, cytoskeleton, Rho and RAC. Uh, and we understand some of the, some of the genetic programs uh, which, which sort of lead to it. This is, this, this, this is an important thing because uh, cancer cells, for example, spontaneously polarize. Polarization is involved in migration. Right, and so again, there's another aspect of shape you can see is, is related to the genetic program. And again, in classical cell biology, as many of you know, many of these things have been studied. I, I, these things are usually studied separately, and there are whole communities and some of them which have, you know, um, which have spread spent many many years and decades trying to understand the molecular biology of these of these processes, and. Uh, you know, if you going through the literature, one is one, one can kind of see that everything which we can sort of identify as a feature of the cell type. So here's a cartoon of a cell on a surface, spread on a surface, and everything you can identify as a kind of a feature. So for example, the structures at the perimeter. So this is a phylopodia, right? And a phylopodia and a lamellopodia. There's no real lamellopodia in the cell, but let's just assume for the sake of argument that here's this is a sort of nascent lamellopodia forming. So lamellopodia is a flat sheet of cross-linked actin. A phylopodia is a bundle of actin, which is extending. Both of these structures are important for, I mean, they determine, obviously, they're part of cell shape, but they're also important for cell migration, for cell exploration of its uh, boundaries, for cell force generation on the substrate, right? And they both evolve through specific genetic programs, which are sort of different from each other. Um, similarly, some of these little protrusions you see could be blebs. Blebs, again, have a specific, you know, genetic protein program behind them. Um, the aspect ratio, as we already saw, comes from row and rack signaling. The spreading comes from adhesion and contractility, substrate properties. And so we could sort of, you know, just by reading the biology, we could, we could sort of conclude that cell morphology should be a biophysical property or originating from the active mechanical property of the cytoskeleton. And so the, the question that arises, which is sort of really interesting, and, you know, among the many other questions that arise, is is there enough information in cell morphology for us to actually solve the inverse problem? Can we infer cell physiological state from cell shape? Um, and what features of cell state are inferable? Obviously, cell state is a very broad term, uh, right? Um, cells, uh, the cell state can differ, for example, for the same cell type. I'm using it in the most general term, um, in the most general sense um, you could sort of imagine. Um, and uh, what, and we don't, but we don't really know uh, what the mapping is going to be between state and morphology. Is definitely going to be a many-to-one mapping. But is this many? You know, is, is there enough information in morphology for us to actually have a meaningful inverse mapping? And so, to some extent, this is, uh, uh, you know, this is an empirical question. And so that's what we basically ended up doing. We ended up actually doing some of the experiments. So our model system for this talk is going to be these following cell lines. This, come, this is a cell model of oncogenesis, which has been developed by a collaborator in uh, CSU. Uh, and so this starts from the retinal epithelial cell line, which is usually a laboratory example of quote unquote, a normal cell line. Uh, and uh, these, these have been transformed through a set of very specific transformations at the end of which all the transformations are the same, but at the end of which uh, three different uh, cell lines have been created by putting in uh, oncogene in all of them. And the oncogene is, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, a mutated AKT gene, there's a mutated MEK gene, and there's a mutated RAS gene. All three of these oncogenes are, um, are constitutively active. And so in this case, this is an active AKT, this is an active MEK, and this is an active RAS. And in mouse models, it has been shown that these cells that have, uh, that these sort of derived cell lines, um, they, are, they actually form tumors. And in the case of uh, AKT, for example, they form fairly aggressive tumors uh, that, that can also metastasize. 
Uh, so we use these cell lines, these four cell lines, the normal cells and these three derived cells, and we basically ask ourselves, are they sort of stereotypical shape changes or morphological changes that, uh, you know, that, that these cell lines display? And one of the reasons why we chose those is because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of work previously which suggests that there's the cancer cytoskeleton is very different from the normal cell cytoskeleton. Measurements have suggested that cancer cells for it are more deformable than corresponding normal cells. Uh, there's some evidence that suggests that deform deformability is believed to increase its metastatic potential. And there's also there's also other evidence that suggests that uh, at least in some cases cells may become softer, but they also become more contractile. That is, they basically exert more contra contractile forces on the substrate. And we know that in this one in vitro model of, uh, of metastasis, uh, which is called uh, the epithelial to mesenchymal transition, or EMT, well, this in vitro model uh, metastasis is actually recognized by characteristic shape changes, which in fact, surprisingly, has been really understudied um, the shape change itself. Right. And so that leads to sort of very, very natural questions linking up uh, shape and the determinants of shape and what, what information there is in shape to this kind of oncogenic transformation. And so what we ask is, do stereotypical shape changes accompany oncogenic transformation and progression? And how well can morphology be used to distinguish between different oncogenic paths? So um, we do very simple experiments. Um, you know, essentially what we do is we culture cells on substrates uh, and we look at them, but we image them, we stain actin and we look at them. Everything which I'm talking about is in fixed cells. We've just recently started working on live cells. Uh, and so hopefully uh, we'll have some results from that soon. And so we have these cell lines, we culture them on glass or fibronectin coated substrates. Uh, we fix them and we stain them with phalloid and adapi. And then we, we take the images uh, using a Cairns microscope and we use a custom written MATLAB as well as cell profiler. Um, the cell image analysis software, and we basically do image processing, uh, and then we do data analysis. And what I'm going to be telling you about today is all based on essentially machine learning uh, analysis. So the first thing we could ask is, how do you actually represent this morphology of this irregular object of the cell? So there's a few things which are kind of obvious, uh, which are sort of crafted features that we've been using for a long time, right? For example, you could have measures of size, you could have measures of elongation, you could have measures of irregularity of the perimeter. Uh, we club them all into what we call geometric features, and there are a whole bunch of them which we, you know, which, which, which we basically take from what other people have used. Um, and then, of course, the worry always is that uh, these geometric features, they are handcrafted, so they are information rich, but they don't contain all the information because, uh, you know, so they may be biased, in other words. And so is there an unbiased way of actually representing cell shape? And so what we use is we use what in the field is are called generative features. Uh, and we use two kinds of generative features. We can represent the cell using it. So you can think of the image of the cell on a surface as essentially something like a two-dimensional function, right? And so you can then expand it in some kind of basis uh, set. And so you, we, we, do, uh, we use a two-dimensional uh, basis set, which are called Zernik moments to do that. Uh, these are what the Zernik moments at different levels look like. Uh, and we also use Fourier series. And in Fourier series, what we do is uh, we basically use two one-dimensional Fourier series to describe the cell. So we can use either X and Y coordinates or uh, the R method of choice is actually to basically form a, form a position vector of the perimeter starting from the center of mass of the cell. Uh, and then the position, the, the, the um, you, you represent the, you represent the coordinate of the position vector in polar coordinates and R and theta coordinates. And then you basically transform R and theta uh, in a Fourier series. And we find that it works really well in representing cell shape. But then one of the interesting things we actually found was that while cell shape, and this is, and we have a bunch of older work, which I'm not talking about, but we found that cell shape is really informative, but um, there's actually a lot of, there appears to be a lot of information that you can see by eye in the structure of the actin cytoskeleton. So here are some examples, for example, of the way the actin cytoskeleton looks in some of the images. All of these are from our own experiments. So here's a cell which has been treated by this drug called cytoclasin D. We find this very characteristic pattern of actin in this in these cells. Uh, here's a mesenchymal stem cell, which is not part of our cancer cells, but this is, these are, you know, this is characterized by these very, uh, very stiff, sort of actin fibers, uh, very, uh, a lot of pneumatic ordering. Uh, here's a cell that looks like it's having a bad hair day, right? It's got a lot of irregularity in its actin structure and also in its perimeter. 
And so the question we started asking ourselves is, you know, are there ways of actually parameter, are, are there ways of actually measuring these sort of measures of, of actin? And so again, we sort of looked at the literature, we looked at the literature in uh, sort of more widely in terms of what people were using in image processing, satellite imagery and other things. And so what we ended up in using is, uh, we have a bunch of things which are called hyaluronic features, or these are called uh, hyaluronic grayscale features. They come from what is called the gray level co-concurrence matrix. Uh, we have uh, features that come from just intensity bands around the nucleus. So we make concentric rings around the nucleus and we, we look at the in relative intensities. And then we also look at the fractal dimension of this, of this stuff. Uh, and so you can analyze the data, you can sort of look at shape changes after transformation, and I'm not going to go into that very much, except to say that you, you do, do see in geometric inter in features which are interpretable you know, to us easily, you do see some very stereotypical shape changes that seem to accompany oncogenic transformation, uh, but the shape changes by themselves aren't huge. You know, I mean, they are statistically significant, but except in a few in a few cases, like for example, nuclear area out here, they are not like uh, at the single cell level, they're not huge shape changes. So the cell distributions are highly overlapping. And the reason why things are statistically significant as we all very well know is because our data set is of the order of hundreds and that gives us very good p-values. So let's not believe that too much. And so what we did was we ended up saying that does single cell morphology predict cell type? Can we use something a little more sophisticated to predict that? So we moved to machine learning. This seemed to be something which is sort of built for a machine learning exercise. And so we started off by basically using a very simple machine learning uh, uh, artificial neural network. Uh, this has a single hidden layer of 10 to 20 nodes. So something, nothing, nothing very sophisticated. Um, and we basically wanted to see, you know, at the single cell level, is it possible to predict the cell type from these morphometrics that we've measured for each cell? Um, and uh, just, you know, everything, all the machine learning, which I'm presenting to you has, has been sort of based on this particular method of, um, of cross-validation or some variant of it, in which we basically have, you know, between anywhere between um, 60 to 80% of the data is used for training. Uh, in some cases, we use, uh, uh, you know, 10 to 20% of the data for regularization. And uh, there is a holdout set, which is uh, usually only 10% of the data and sometimes more. And this holdout set has never seen the algorithm except finally, when we use it for a pure prediction. So every number I'm giving you is coming from the average of the, uh, the remaining 10% of the data, which is, uh, you know, all the data has been used for it. So essentially what we do is we do, uh, we do a tenfold cross validation in which every single 10% uh, of the data, every single sort of, you know, um, block of 10% of the data is used once for, uh, for uh, uh, the pure prediction step. Uh, so, uh, so, so we basically, you know, we, this is what we do. We have the data, we train the data, um, we use validation for a certain percentage of data. You can see the percentages are different because uh, it kind of, we, we, we changed it a little bit depending on the amount of training data and the question we were asking. Um, we build the classifier and then we, you know, validate and optimize the classifier using the validation data. And then we use this test data, the holdout data, just to see how accurate is this. And, uh, and then we average it uh, over, all the, over all the data. And so the first result is that, you know, this is actually surprisingly accurate. Transformed cells can be distinguished from normal at a very high, with very high accuracy. I'm not showing you all the data because there's a lot of results I want to take you through. Uh, and so we get over 90% accuracy uh, when we are just doing binary classification between transformed cells and normal cells. And we can also ask, you know, can we actually distinguish the normal cells from each other? So, you know, AKT cells from MEK cells, for example. So remember the three oncogenic transformations was AKT, MEK, and RAS. So I'm just going to be referring to them by AKT, MEK, and RAS. So we can actually distinguish these three from each other by with a fairly high accuracy uh, above 80% in all these cases. So um, uh, I'm going to skip a lot of the details from this study. It's actually been published, so you can read it. Uh, the question which I'm going to be talking about in the remaining seven or eight minutes of this talk is, 
does actin organization carry morphological signatures of cell state? That's kind of one of the questions which, uh, you know, as a sort of soft matter person, I was, I was very interested in. So to answer this question, right, we have to ask what features are important for the classification. And we found that we needed both cell shape and textural information for accurate classification. And removal of textual information led to a significant drop in accuracy, but using only textual information proved useless. That is, the algorithm could not classify correctly at all. So we reasoned that the textual parameters we were using were too few to represent the complexity of actin organization. You know, they were, there's, there's uh, fractal dimension is one number. Hadalic features are about 24 in number, but they're actually highly co mutually correlated with each other. So, you know, in a low dimensional space, they're probably two or three. Um, and the band-based measures are again, like maybe three or four effectively in, in total. So we, we literally have a very handful, a very small handful of textual parameters. We spent some time trying to say, can we actually come up with new textual parameters? And then we gave up the plan and we decided to just go back to machine learning to CNNs uh, or convolutional neural networks. And convolutional neural networks, as uh, I think we all know by now, are, uh, are networks which actually take the raw image itself and we basically let the computer, we let the algorithm pick the features instead of handcrafting features for the algorithm to pick. And a lot of the recent hype around deep learning has come from CNN's abilities to classify images. Now, the problem with CNN is that they typically require huge uh, training databases but thankfully, there's in the last few years, there's been the development of these, this method called transfer learning, and that gives us a way to repurpose already trained CNNs for small databases. And so what we ended up using was a, a, a much older uh, CNN called ResNet 50 that became very well known around 2015, 2018, when it sort of outperformed some of the other big uh, uh, CNNs. This has been pre-trained on the ImageNet image database um, which contains millions of images. It's a very large network. It has 50 convolutional layers. There's no way a small uh, database could have trained this network. Uh, but what we basically now can do is we can preserve the entire network architecture, except for the output layer, right? The key thing out here is that we are using all the conv convolutional filters that this network has already optimized for the images it's looking at. Right, and these filters will do things like detect different aspects of the image. Like, for example, some of them could detect edges. Some of them could detect transitions of different kinds between intensities. So the filters all remain the same. All that changes is the weights. And so we retrain the network. We retrain that network to get the weights. And of course, we have to change the output layer uh, depending, you know, for our classification tasks. So uh, we also make a synthetic control image set. And so we do this by sort of randomly clubbing together images of, uh, you know, so for example, when we are doing uh, RAS versus AKT, we take half of the RAS, half of the AKT, mix them together and, and, you know, do the same for a second class. And we make two random classes just to see whether the CNN is actually just picking up noisy artifacts in the imaging, which we don't know about and is classifying on the basis of that. And so the nice thing is that our CNNs actually outperform our ANNs. They show even higher accuracy than the ANNs. Uh, and, uh, you know, normal cells can be distinguished from transformed cells again, but with over 90% accuracy and the percentage is a little better than the ANNs in all cases. Uh, Transform cells can be identified with, from each other with an average accuracy of between 80 to 87%. This is, I think, roughly the same. But the thing which makes me really happy is actually that accuracy in the control database is about 50%, which is little better than random guessing. We can also do multi-class learning because this is actually built for multi-class learning. And we find that uh, multi-class learning actually works really well with some really high accuracies in some cases. This is, uh, I haven't shown you the averages here, but this is just one, uh, one um, fold of the multi-class learning uh, algorithm. And you can see that uh, we haven't, I haven't, I haven't cherry picked the best, best fold. Uh, the numbers you get are pretty high. They're all about between 80 to 85% again on average over all the folds. Uh, and again, you see that you get pretty high accuracy, right? But so the interesting question is uh, now, what is, this, what is this algorithm seeing? Is it seeing cell shape? Is it seeing actin organization? What features of actin organization? So to ask this question, what we did was we binarized all the images like the way I'm showing, and we ran the classification algorithm again using the binarized images. And what we found was that uh, we found that, and so the green in this case is the accuracy of the uh, classification algorithm on the binarized images. And you can see that there's a significant drop in accuracy. And so if you assume that, you know, 50% accuracy is equivalent with no information. And so we basically have to explain the remaining, you know, 40, 40, 
plus percentage. Uh, about 45 to 65% of the accuracy of the CNN is due to information which is hidden in some way in this Acton organization. And so then you could ask, how, what does the algorithm see? Right. And, uh, you know, as, as many of us know, this is kind of one of the questions which the computer science world has been grappling with, like how do you explain or how do you interpret what these CNNs are actually seeing? And there are a number of tools that people have developed with varying degrees of success, depending upon the kind of uh, images you're looking at. One of the very common tools used is something called LIME, Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations. And uh, one of the reasons why I like it is that, you know, as someone who's not a trained machine learning person, this does something very simple. What it does is it takes the image and combines them and it takes the image and it basically forms these super pixels by putting regions of the image together initially in a sort of a random way. And then it replaces, makes that essentially equivalent to background. And then it reruns the classification exercise looking for a significant drop in accuracy. So it does identify regions of the image that appear to be especially important for this classification exercise. One nice thing about Lime is that its results can also give confidence that the model is actually doing something, uh, you know, biologically relevant. For example, you know, is it picking up artifacts in the background? And so we ran Lime on our data and the good news is that it never picked up the background. And in many cases, actually, we couldn't interpret Lime itself because it picked up the whole cell or almost the whole cell. But there were a number of cases where it highlighted subcellular features. And again, in the interest of time, this is all unpublished work, by the way. We have a paper submitted for, uh, for publication. And so hopefully you'll be able to read it very soon. But in the interest of time, I'm just going to show you one example. And this example is really is kind of nice. Uh, the, I mean, these sets of examples are, again, interpretations by eye of what we think Lyme is seeing. And so when, when you're looking at the classification exercise of normal versus AKT cells, in some cells, Lyme highlights these uh, feature, these sort of areas which have been sort of outlined in yellow. and um, um, if you look inside these features uh, in higher resolution than I have here, what you'll see is that in the RPA19 cells, in the normal cells, you'll see that all these regions show a thick cortical actin band with very sparse actin intensity in the interior. And for these AKT cells, you will see that the actin fiber structure always has some pneumatic ordering, a very distinct pneumatic ordering, but there's some cross cutting. It also has a few fibers that are oriented at right angles to this predominant direction. Question is, are these actually morphological signatures of that particular genotype? Can we link them? These are questions, these are sort of, I think, really exciting questions that can emerge from an analysis like this um, that we are still trying to figure out how to, how to answer. But hopefully what I've convinced you is that cell morphology is a window into cell state. Uh, cell morphology is a product of and influences cell state. It's multidimensional, it's information rich. And uh, there is, I think, uh, I pose this as a question, but it's actually not a question any longer. There is a single cell morpho-omics waiting to be developed. Imaging is far cheaper and naturally high through compared with single cell omics technologies. And I think uh, these sort of, uh, these, these images of cells with internal structures highlighted, in this case, the actin cytoskeleton, but probably definitely others, give us a huge amount of information about internal processes. As uh, Yogi Berra, uh, you know, said immortally, was immortalized by one, one of his immortal statements is you can observe a lot by just watching. So thank you very much. And I'd be happy to take questions. I just want to say that every all the CNN work is a product of an incredibly bright undergraduate student, Sydney Elder, for a lot of the previous work, most of which I couldn't talk about is comes from um, my former graduate student, Ilahe, uh, and an even older graduate student, Samant uh, uh, Sami. I'd be happy to take questions. So let's, let's thank the speaker for a really, really fascinating talk. Um, thank you so much. Uh, since we're almost at the top of the hour, I think what we will do is uh, look at one question from the chat and then stop recording and keep discussing the questions um, informally uh, for everyone who can stay. I think um, that hopefully that sounds like a, a good plan. Um, so there's a question from uh, Mark Champlin Lowell in the chat. Uh, have you tried using a convolutional network to classify the cell from the image rather than the features? Yeah, so the second half of my talk was all about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, and, oh, and actually, yes. <laughs> and okay, I, I missed the, uh, the follow up in there that he asked the question before he answered it in the talk. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, um, 
I guess let's, uh, let's thank both speakers one more time for really, really fascinating talks. Um, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. And um, I'm gonna stop recording now and then we can just continue discussing and maybe bounce back and forth between uh, questions for both speakers for as long as people have time to, to stay. Um, so.